Um, thank you very much for having me here today. Um, as Helen said, my name is Sarah Briggs. I'm the Collections Development Officer for the Museums Association. Um, I very much hope you're here today to hear about the funding that we can offer to both individuals and organisations. Um, but rather than launch straight in, I need to give you, a, I do need to give a little bit of background on who the MA are, because it really does underpin our funding programmes and therefore will help you um, formulate some great applications. So the Museums Association are a vibrant membership organisation. We exist to support museums and the people that work in and with museums. We're a relatively small organisation, um, but I think we pack a really big punch. There's only 20 of us in total. Um, we're supported by a board of 12 board members who oversee our work. And we do try really, really hard to deliver um, as much value as we can to the sector. So among the events that we offer is our annual conference. Last year, this was online because of COVID, of course, um, but our last in-person conference was held in Brighton in 2019, and that was attended by 1,200 people, making it our biggest sort of physical conference yet. Um, this year, we're taking lessons from um, our, our successful conference in 2020, um, and we're gonna offer a hybrid conference with an option to attend in person in Liverpool, which um, if you can make it, I do recommend it. Liverpool's a lovely city with some amazing museums. Um, but we're also offering the same online offering as we had in 2020. So that becomes a cheaper option if you don't want to go in person. Um, we really, really loved how inclusive our 2020 conference was. Um, it was a bit hair raising at times, planning um, an online conference when we, we thought we were gonna be doing in person. Um, and I must admit, we were all quite nervous about how the sort of networking elements and the, the chat and the really vibrant atmosphere of conference would, would be replicated. But it really did feel like um, a really inclusive and um, a really, really supportive event for the sector. And there were some really great conversations going on in the chat. So we were really, really pleased about that. And we want to keep some of that for um, Liverpool this year. Um, so we, we had a far more represented selection of the workforce in, in 2020 um, because um, of the flexibility that an online conference offers. So that's just in terms of partly, you know, partly in terms of time. So we can't all jot off for three days without really seriously thinking about the logistics of it. I certainly can't. Um, we'll have, you know, and there's a lot of planning that can go into it. Um, but it also means that it's less expensive to run and that's a cost saving we can pass on to our members. Conference isn't something that we run for profit, it's something that we run just to wash our faces really, um, but conference venues are expensive. Um, and so um, having those options of being able to attend physically or virtually means that we're hoping that we'll still be able to keep that great inclusive atmosphere that we had in 2020. So as well as our conference, we offer other events. So through the pandemic, you may have seen our coronavirus conversations where we tackled some sort of really big issues as and when they, they came up, they were quite responsive. So there was one on Black Lives Matter, there's one on climate crisis. Um, we also run events that are sort of very specialist to particular areas of work for museums. So um, coming up in the autumn, we've got amazing spaces designing great exhibitions. And we also try to run events that are suited to people at different stages of their career. So uh, again, coming up later this year, we've got Don't Stop Me Now, which is an event that we run for early career professionals. Um, at the moment, all of these events are planned to be virtual events. So again, it makes it easier to attend. If you can't attend those days, because we all still have commitments, um, it gives you the option to catch up on the event after the date. Um, and of course, um, uh, you know, not having to, to pay for a venue means that it does make it less expensive for our members to attend. Um, so as well as events, we have our journal, which um, hopefully you'll have seen. You can choose with your membership option. You can have the physical magazine journal still, but um, you can also choose to have that digitally as well. So you, you don't have to have that paper trail. We are trying to be much more um, conscious of our climate, um, climate footprint, really. Um, so a bi-monthly journal covers sector developments and trends. It includes um, sections on museum practice, which are articles on much more practical issues, 
um, and they have things like case studies, best practice and advice. So there's a, there's a lot in, the, in those journals. As well as the journal, we advocate for the sector. Um, it's been a really critical part of our role over the last year and a half. So it's been about make, helping to make the case for emergency funding during the pandemic. Um, we've also, um, over the last, last year and a half, convened a working group on decolonisation to support the sector's valuable work in this area and look out for um, some resources to help support the sector on that. Um, and you should have seen, um, the, you know, we're, we're happy to, to, to respond to um, government, um, government statements on, on decolonisation as well. So we're here to sort of really support the sector. Um, as well as that, we um, champion ethical practice. The Museums Association hold the Code of Ethics, but we also have an ethics committee. So if the Code of Ethics doesn't provide you with guidance, you can come to the ethics committee with specific issues and they'll help guide and support you. So they're there to support you with all those tricky issues that we often get, those, all those you know, shades of grey that we often get in the museum sector. Um, so if you're a member organisation or individual member, you can feel supported to make the right choices. Um, we're here for career development as well. So of course you'll have things like we've got job adverts on our website, um, but we, and we run our professional development programs that I've already mentioned. Um, but we also have um, some very specific um, longer term programs that we offer to help people with their professional development. For example, our AMA, Associateship of the Museums Association, but we're also running things like mentoring schemes at the moment. Um, and more recently, in the last couple of years, we've released our online learning offering. It's called Museums and Essentials, and there's modules on ethics, collections, partnership working and learning. And that's a free resource for members. Um, and there will be more um, sections uh, on this um, later this year as well. We're constantly working to update that and add new modules. Now, the reason we can do all of this work with such a small workforce is because of our members. So our members fund our work, which is really critical. Um, we have um, a lot of members who help support our work. So we'll, we have um, uh, representatives who are volunteers who work in specific areas and they're there to, to, to really help spread the word. And we, we couldn't do it. We couldn't do what we do without our volunteers. Um, membership includes individuals, institutions and corporate supporters. So we have different membership options. And um, really critically, it means that we are independent. We don't get any regular government support, and that allows us to stand up for the sector without fear or favour. We're here because of our members, and we're here very much for our members. So all of this work that we do is underpinned by our strategic framework. Um, that includes our things like our mission, vision and values. Uh, which I put up there on the screen, but I won't, I won't go through every one of those because you can all see the slide, hopefully. Um, this year, we've got various different priorities. So as we recover from the pandemic, we will um, continue to advocate for museums. So we'll continue to make the case for investment in museums to politicians, stakeholders and funders across all four nations. We try really hard to get a good balance and support all the museums. We want to work even more ethically. So we're focusing in particular on tackling the climate crisis, on decolonizing our museums and taking an ethical approach to our workforce. You'll have seen initiatives like our redundancy tracker at the moment, hopefully. Um, we're, we're, we're trying really hard to monitor the situation for museum staff and make sure that they're supported um, throughout this really, really difficult time for museums. We want to build on our flagship Museums Change Lives campaign, which hopefully you'll have seen. Um, I recommend a read of that and I recommend looking at some of the case studies and resources on our website, especially um, if you are interested in applying to some of our funds, which I will talk about later. Um, so Museums Change Lives basically encourages more museums to work in partnership ways to deliver social impact, to be relevant to their communities and to tackle pressing contemporary issues in society. So, as I mentioned, we also want to concentrate on the museum workforce. Um, we are, are campaigning for a representative workforce with fair and equitable pay, progressive rights and conditions, 
and a sector that seeks to support the health and well-being of its staff. And that's a really big focus of the Museums Association at the moment. Now, this segues me in quite nicely to talking about one of our funding offers. And this one is something that we offer to individuals rather than organisations. And that is the Benevolent Fund. The Benevolent Fund exists to support museums association members facing financial difficulties and also to support financial support for professional development. We know that the need for um, the hardship fund has been heightened by the pandemic. So we are trying really hard to be responsive to this. So for example, recently we offered an additional scheme to our longer term members whose finances have been significantly affected by the current pandemic. However, we do continue to offer hardship grants to those who need them regardless of length of membership. Um, we hope that you won't need the hardship support fund, but it is there should you need it. And we're very happy to, um, to talk to, to people about it. All the information is on our website. More generally speaking though, and I hope that this will apply to more of you, that the fund is a really great way to support professional development. So I'll go through some key points in the criteria, but the Benevolent Fund is not the fund I work on, so I will be honest with you, this isn't my specialist area, but the details are on our website and, um, and there are people in our team who'd be really happy to talk to you about it who know much more about this fund than me. But there is no length of membership required to apply to this fund, and it's open to all levels of membership. So if you just joined last week and you've got our, you know, our very cheapest membership option for online only, um, you're absolutely eligible to apply. It's a monthly funding cycle as well. So we can be really, really responsive to people's needs. Um, you don't sort of have to wait once a year to apply. Um, there's also no need to provide financial information. So we're not going to ask for reams and reams of evidence. Um, this is quite a critical point. This fund is usually undersubscribed. Um, you can also apply as many times as you want in a funding year. If you're a museum association member, it means you get access to funding to pay for our professional developments programs and events, the ones that we host at the museums association. And um, for professional development program fees, so that's things like our AMA, um, you can claim up to 50% or 75% or 75%, but that higher rate is if you've been made redundant, if you're on universal credit, or if you're a freelancer who has due to COVID had your ability to work compromised. Um, payments for our events might be fully or partially funded. Um, and if you are a candidate or an alumnus of any of, of any of our professional development programmes, so that's things like the AMA, our FMA, or one of our Transformers programmes we've run in the past, it means you can apply for funding for professional development provided by other providers as well, which is a huge membership benefit. Payment for um, other aspects of professional development might be fully or partially funded again and up to a maximum value of £400. So there's a lot there in that fund. As I say, it's not really made the most of by our membership. So do have a consider, consider looking at that fund um, if you do feel that some of the professional development that you require is, is, a bit, is a bit too pricey and not something that you can comfortably manage. Um, moving on to another one of our funds. Um, this one is also undersubscribed. And it's the Beecroft bequest. It's a bit of a um, tongue twister. It's a fairly straightforward, easy fund to explain. So I'm only going to spend a minute on this. And again, all the details are on our website about it. But the headline um, of this fund is that it's open to institutional members. So your organisation must be a member of the Museums Association. And um, it provides grants of up to £10,000. Um, to support the acquisition of pre-19th century pictures and works of art by old masters or worthy school pictures of old masters. I'm not sure I would necessarily put too much sway on the old masters bit, um, given that they don't come up for auction that often, but think about what you count as a work of art. Um, so we were one of several funders able to um, help um, Eli Museum um, to acquire this Bronze Age talk um, on the slide. And that's really all I need to say about this fund. As I say, all the information is on our website. The fund I'd really, really like to talk to you about today, and the one that I work on day in, day out, is the Esme Fairburn Collections Fund. 
this fund has awarded over 10 million pounds to 145 projects since it launched in 2011. In 2020 alone, we launched and awarded um, our sustaining engagement with collections grants, awarding 26 um, grants to museums to support work that responded to the COVID-19 pandemic um, and finding ways to share collections when traditional and physical access wasn't possible. This year, we'll be awarding £1.3 million to around 14 to 20 projects that focus on collections engagement. We've just awarded seven of these, although they've not been announced yet. So watch this space to find out who those um, winning projects were. There are two funding streams in the Esme Fairburn Collections Fund. Both of them offer grants of up to £90,000 and both of them are for projects that are around two years long. And the next expression of interest deadline, date for your diaries for both of these um, elements of the fund is the 13th of September. It's a two-stage process, so if you applied in, on, in September, you would know by the end of the month if you've been shortlisted. You'd then have some time to fill out a shortlisting for um, a second stage application form, and you'd know by December if you were successful or not. So you'd be ready to go with the money in 2022. All of our applicants need to meet a set of essential requirements relating to using existing, engage, existing collections to engage audiences. So that's the universal thing about the collections fund that will, that is, will never change. And then you can apply to one of two strands. The first strand is what we call creative collections engagement. It's to test new ambitious creative collections engagement that has a social impact. And these grants are for museums to innovate or kickstart practice where there's a strong link between a relevant collection and an audience. So it's much like the um, collections fund grants we've offered in the past. Or alternatively, um, this one's a little bit newer, you can use your experience of participatory practice to develop new models of collections engagement with communities. Um, we anticipate this would be work with communities living with the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. Applicants for these grants need to demonstrate that they operate at best practice level or higher in the Museums Association's participatory practice framework, Power to the People. So the first step in that really, if you haven't already, is to undertake an exercise to see where you are in that framework. And if you were best practice level or higher, um, it would mean that you're in a position to develop um, what we see as replicable ways of working with communities um, as we all live with the impact of the pandemic. Um, these projects should fit in with the strategic aims of your organisation and be developmental as models of your models for the sector. So really, we expect these um, applications to come from organisations who are a little bit more experienced at working in a participatory way and therefore better able to develop replicable models and more likely to have participatory practice embedded within their strategic aims. We particularly welcome across both of these strands applications that align with our priorities, which is why I went through with you earlier on about what the MA is here for and what our strategic priorities are um, for the future. So things like highlighting climate crisis, decolonization or democratizing collections practice are really welcomed. But I do think the best way to see the sorts of things that we're looking for is to give you a couple of examples um, of projects recently funded. Both of these examples are from the same group of museums, but both have got very different aims. So the first example I'd like to talk to you about is the University Museum of Zoology in Cambridge. They were awarded a grant for the Collections Fund for their project, Butterflies Through Time. It's a project using the museum's vast collection of butterflies, all of them collected locally over a period of 200 years. Um, the project aims to engage people with the natural world and environmental change, both past and present. And they want to do this by linking historical zoological specimens with modern conservation initiatives. As part of the project, they're digitally cataloguing their UK butterfly specimens from both their museum, but also from other local collections. And the idea is they can use this data to analyse long term biodiversity change, and that will directly inform contemporary habitat restoration projects. 
They're partnering with local conservation groups and the activities that they're running um, focus on reaching um, some of the lower income families and schools that don't engage with them that much. Um, they want to encourage the use of local green spaces as well as the museum um, and encourage people to interact with nature um, by demonstrating the benefits it can offer in terms of well-being. So not only does this focus or project focus on an area that's a priority area for both the Museums Association and the Esme Fairburn Foundation in terms of climate crisis, but it also links the collection beautifully um, with um, issues around, um, as, as well as climate crisis, about around health and well-being um, of an audience group that they've not really engaged with. So it will help the museum develop those audiences, but really critically, there's some real, real benefits there for the people that they want to um, participate in the project by going out, they're taking activities outside of the museum, going into green spaces and really getting people to experience nature. The next project is, um, it's very recent, this one, it was only awarded in December, so it's not fully up and running yet. So it's very much one to watch. And this is Fitzwilliam Museum. It's part of the Cambridge University Museums um, group again. And they were awarded £89,431 for their project, working together to confront the legacies of empire. It's a programme of work to confront the legacies of empire, as you might imagine, um, and think about um, the legacies of enslavement within their collections. They're going to develop methods of participatory practice to engage with community collaborators. They want to undertake sustained interrogation of collections from a range of different perspectives. And overall, they want to examine the impact of colonialism, enslavement, racial inequality, and other challenging topics within their collections. They're going to work with collections that will include materials from slave ships, visual representations of Africa, Africans and enslaved people, um, but also less directly objects and works of art acquired from the financial proceeds of slave ownership and objects acquired from founders and donate donors whose wealth derived from markets that relied on slave based labour. So, for example, they know that many of their artworks that form their core collection were donated by men who got much of their wealth from the South Sea Company investments and other slave derived wealth, um, slavery derived wealth. So their exploration, exploration cuts through to the very foundation of their museum. The activities they want to undertake will um, seek to change the power dynamic. Um, they will provide a more culturally inclusive experience and they will help marginalized and historically excluded communities feel more included and welcome in the museum. And in the longer term, they want to improve the workforce diversity across the museum but also across the wider university. So the programme really reaches out across all levels of the organisation. Now, I've probably talked at you for quite a long time, but I do need to finish on some um, key headlines about the Collections Fund before you, you think about applying. Um, as I said, all of the information is on our website. Um, there's a funding tab, so I show, I show you here on the slide where that funding tab is. Find the funding tab at the top. Um, it's there for you to refer to, and my contact details are there critically as well. Um, I think it's really important and very useful in thinking about the fund to understand what we don't fund more than what we do. So things that we don't fund include capital costs. So that's things like building work, renovations, equipment. Um, we don't fund things like that. We might cover a small amount of equipment. So, for example, we might cover some acid free tissue for a collections project or a PC for a new member of staff that's going to work on the project, but not if it's a significant proportion of the budget. If you're not sure, ask us. Um, I usually say, um, you know, we'll provide the boxes to go on the shelves, but we won't provide the shelves. Um, we don't cover core funding. So, this funding is specifically for project work. But we do really like to see projects that are embedded in your overall museum journey. So projects that help your museum achieve its overall um, strategic aims. We don't sort of want to parachute in and parachute out with no longer term benefit for your organisation. So really think about what the legacy of a short term project would be. And at the moment, we're looking for projects to last about two years long. 
We know that staffing is critical. Um, I come from a collections background. I know that the main thing that stops people doing the work on the collections is that there's not enough people and time. Um, so usually most of the people that apply for our fund, most of the budget goes on staffing, um, collections and engagement staff. Um, and whilst we don't support core funding, that doesn't mean that that person can't be a core member of staff. So if you want to retain the knowledge of your project in-house, you can recruit a core, core member of staff to that project, and then you can use the funding to backfill their position. So that is absolutely possible. You could also recruit freelance staff if you prefer to. So backfilling is absolutely fine, as is additional hours. So if you've got a part-time member of staff and you think they could work on a project for the other two days a week that they don't work, that's again, that's also acceptable. We would count that as outside of core costs. I think it's always useful to ask yourself what your project outcomes will be at the beginning. And I always say to people to try and think about three outcomes. I always say, think about one about the collections, to think about how the collections will benefit, how they will be opened up or how they will be improved or how the information you hold on them will be improved. Then think about your participants. So think about the people involved in the project. So think about what they're going to gain from the work is it really mutually beneficial? Are they coming in as essentially volunteers for you for, as a free workforce? Or are they actually going to leave at the end of the project having benefited, having um, gained skills or just experiences to improve their life? And then think about how your organisation will develop as a result of the project. Um, what will you have learned at the end of it? What will the legacy be? How will you have developed your practice or your skill set? Think about what's in it for the organisation. If you can come up with three, um, three goals around, around collections people and organisation, then this one probably is a good fit for you. I'm always happy to have conversations with people before they apply or even before your idea is fully developed. I'll be honest, so you won't waste your time if the project isn't going to be the right fit for you. But what I'll also do is ask you the questions that I think you'll need to address in an application. So if your idea isn't fully formed, I might ask you the questions to help you get there. Um, expressions of interest are 5 p.m. The deadline is 5 p.m. on the 13th of September for our 2021 round. The fund will be back in 2022. We're not sure what form it's likely to be. As I say, the focus being on collections and engagement isn't going to change. So I hope that you'll see the good opportunity that this fund provides to use collections to engage audiences. And I hope you'll see the impact that that can have on organisations. I hope my introduction to the Museums Association is going to help you consider what we might be looking for in applications for the future. Um, and on that note, I think I'm a little past the time, but I hope that won't be a problem. But thank you so much for listening today. Um, and I'm here to take any questions if you have any. Thanks, Sarah. Do you want to stop? Yeah, brilliant. Okay. Does anyone joining us have any questions? Do you want to, Sarah, you've got your mic off. Do you want to just, yeah. just wave your hand about? There's only a few of us here. So, yeah. <laughs> that, Sarah, that was so Hi, helpful. Sarah. Thank you so much. Um, and that really clearly articulated the Esme Fairburn Collections Fund. Does Watts Gallery need to be a member of the Museums Association to apply for You're frozen for me, Sarah. I don't know if that's me or you. So I didn't catch any of that. I wonder if you could repeat that question. I'm so sorry. No, it's worry. my internet collection apparently is unstable, so I do apologise. But no, don't, you don't you worry at all. I've, well, firstly, just to say that you really clearly articulated the Esme, Esme Fairburn Collections Fund. Thank you so much. It's been something that we've been considering for a while, but um, conscious that we need to select the right project to fit to the fund. Um, do we need to be a museum association member to apply? The organisation needs to be a member to apply. Yes. Um, and I would absolutely, there is a, an exhibition that we would like to... Uh, I'm so sorry you've frozen again for me. Sarah, pop your, your question in the chat. 
And that would be we very can, helpful. If yeah, hopefully we can catch chat. up with it. Yeah. Um, does, I mean, I have a couple of questions, but I can't see Dominic or you, Chris, but did, if either of you had a question at all, or do you want to just um, unmic and, sh and shout? Dominic, do you have something? Yeah, I'm so sorry. I, I don't know what's, why I can't be seen, but uh, no, thank you very much for that excellent um, introduction. Um, I think we are keen to put in uh, an application, but our, our situation is a bit um, tricky at the moment. I don't know if you, you've heard, but uh, the Society of Antiquaries, uh, we're fighting with our landlord uh, about our rent, which has gone up okay. uh, by 3,000%. And we just, until we get that sorted, we can't apply for any funding because we've got no really? assurance of, of, of our, uh, our, our tenancy here. So are you just wanting some assurance that there will be some sort of fund in 2022 because there absolutely will and there'll be two deadlines again it'll be a spring deadline and another September deadline so um, it, it will still be there for you next year Dominic hopefully when hopefully that's all resolved for you but if you wanted to have a conversation with me beforehand that's absolutely fine you don't have to be applying in the next round in order to book a conversation with me. Yes I, I because you can't see me I what I'll do so is I'll drop you a line and just give you a very sort of short summary of where we are uh, and so you can uh, just to fill you in with the background. So sorry everyone I'm losing my internet connection I think. Did you hear any of that Sarah? I didn't I'm so sorry Dominic I didn't hear that second bit at I'll all. Just, I'll, I will drop you a line just to Perfect. I'll put my email address in the chat. Yeah, will do. Thank you. There we go. And then I'm very happy to follow up with people afterwards if they have specific questions. All hanging on by a thread, I think. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just have a quick look at Sarah's before, see if we can we can answer it. Uh, I think she just wants to, as Dominic, discuss a project which they've got in mind. Um, Absolutely, yeah. It'll no have a huge impact on their organisation, which is obviously really interesting. Um, so, yeah, so if, if, you, if you put your email, if you're happy to do that, Sarah, so there's a few of us here, isn't there? So if you put your yeah. email in the chat, then um, I can... Um, Dominic is still on the call, Sarah's still on the call, and those can contact you directly then. Yeah, absolutely. Um, That's either no for problem. this, I'm presuming, maybe not for September, but either or September yeah. or, or the next round, yeah. Yeah, that's fine. The, as I say, the, the key... The foundations of the fund aren't going to change. It will we'll always be looking for projects that use collections to achieve social impact. And that's not going to change in 2022. So I'm very happy to talk to people about their ideas now, even if they're not going to apply until next year or even after. That's absolutely fine. Um, and yeah, uh, what I will say is that um, I'm on annual leave as of, to, as of later on today for a week and a bit. So if you do email me and you do get silence or you get my out of office, don't panic. I'll be back and I'll be in touch with you. Mm. And you're part time as well, aren't you, Sarah? Yeah, I work yeah. Mondays to Wednesdays. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, I mean, Sarah, did you want to have a quick go? Did you want to have a quick overview of what, what you were thinking there? I'm quite curious now. I want to know. <laughs> um, yeah, we're, we're, doing, um, we're doing a lot of work um, at the moment around what's Gallery Trust's sculpture collection and its complicated history and its associations with uh, uh, colonisation. So, um, and I can't say too much only because, so what we would like to do is go through quite a big consultative process, um, which uh, we have uh, gone out to tender on. So we've got as far as that, but obviously it's, it's a lengthy and uh, involved process. And as part of that, we would like to program a, an exhibition around our sculpture collection, um, which not much is known about anyway, um, to uh, enable us to have those 
wider conversations. The only reason I'm hesitating is that that exhibition is scheduled for next summer. So it, it and it would be a part of a, a longer conversation. Um, I, these sorts of things have to be ongoing and there has to be yeah. constant reassessments, but it's a huge piece of work for us. We have got money from Esme Fairburn before via another fund. Mm -hmm. um, and I understand that the outgoing chair, I know who, who's sadly no longer with us, and I'm not sure whether Esme Fairburn generally uh, thinks of us as quite uh, old fashioned Victorian museum. And we've changed quite significantly over the last four years. So we would obviously um, highlight that in our application. Yeah. We're a national portfolio organization mm -hmm. and we're very much working to a framework um, as set up by Arts Council's Let's Create Strategy, which is all mm -hmm. around environmental sustainability and um, irrelevance and inclusivity and all those sorts of things. So we're quite a different, or we've really changed over the last four years, but I think for our organization, this this particular piece of work is going to be quite a stretch. Okay. Um, so both for our, what I would call the Watts family, uh, so, and that would include our trustees. I think there's a, often there's a, there's a, there's a perception, uh, different perceptions depending on somebody's age I have found. So my donors and possibly some of the trustees have a very different view to say the much younger, more ambitious members of the curatorial team who are all about decolonization and all those sorts of things so that I think there's quite a big piece of work for our organization speaking extremely candidly and this is totally confidential obviously yeah. but um, I would absolutely love to uh, enable the organization to, to do what it would like to do and this fund sounds absolutely ideal I might be stretched to get an expression of interest by the 13th of September but I can certainly try I know the our directors, who's been a director for the last four years, is really passionate about all of this stuff and has made a lot of changes, but this would be the next step. So I can definitely well, have a look at the form because yeah. it's not very it's not a very onerous process, the expression of interest. Okay. And it will ask you about your organization. So you'll have a chance to say about how your organization's changed and it'll ask you about the collection and ask you about what you want to do. But you don't have to have everything fully formed in that expression of interest stage. So mm -hmm. it might be that it's shortlisted and, and you get it through them. But it, a conversation with me would definitely be a great starting point. So I would suggest we take it offline at some point. What I might do then is look at the form and, 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 um, and start answering those questions. And then, then perhaps in a discussion with you, it would be good to understand if the outcomes that, that I have listed are meaningful or relevant. And then we can sort of take it from yeah. there. Absolutely. That sounds great. It does sound like the sort of project we'd be really interested in hearing about for sure. So I'm sure that we can, you know, I'm sure we can have a conversation about whether those outputs and, and what you want to do marries in with the fund. Yeah. It'd be quite interesting as well to see how if you went forward with that exhibition, how how doing that exhibition and showing that with your organisation and your trustees, how that might change their views just, so, just by doing it in that sort of traditional way, doing what you do, essentially, but exploring those themes and running deeper with it. Maybe maybe they will learn a lot just through that process without it having to be a sort of separate, full on, right, let's go on, you know, some specific training for our trustees, et cetera, et cetera, but just through doing the work that yeah, you normally real, do. There's a real fear factor there, I think. Um, I think consulting, they are really fearful of that and the and the outcomes that it, it poses. But I think it's a being open and transparent and perhaps not having black and white conversations, but more exploring wider issues uh, is the advice that, that we, we've had. Because as I say, we've gone out to tender with a number of um, organisations to get the right organisation to do the consultation. It's just having the money to actually run the consultation. So, yeah. Okie dokie. That's really, really helpful. Thank you so much. Brilliant. I really look forward to talking to you about this project. It sounds really interesting. Brilliant. Thank mm -hmm. you, Sarah. And have a lovely holiday. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>
and thank you so much for organising. That's okay. It's been a bit quiet this one, but um, Sarah's happy that it's going to go online, and 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 yeah. and also I think it will just be a few people that will be really like geared up for this. But I think the more that we get the message out there that this fund exists, you know, then then going you know next year maybe, and and actually we're running our own um, program that's got a very similar name to yours, which I was a bit worried about <laughs> which is all about you know um creative but it's about collections development but working with underserved communities so that might actually tie in really well with yours because we don't have as much funding as you do for grants. so <laughs> it might be that we can sort of warm up some museums you know Absolutely. and actually say actually that fund is going to be brilliant you know do a bit of test yeah. work here with us with the small amounts of money that we have and yeah. you know mm -hmm. we're doing and actually it'd be lovely to maybe we're thinking about setting up some um, well we are going to do some open forums so as you were talking Sarah it was making me think that maybe we might invite you in long, along to one of those um, to get some of these discussions going yeah mm. that would be great it, yeah it, it is a it's a is a it's a conversation we're keeping quite close to our chest at the moment only because there's a real nervousness around it so yeah if you if you wouldn't mind sort of not discussing Sarah it. Briggs sorry Sarah Briggs not Sarah oh, James don't yeah. worry <laughs> Don't worry, oh, I won't let the cat out of the bag yet. <laughs> but Sarah James, just to reassure you, it's it's not the only sort of conversation on this line that I've had with people, and, and I, I know I do understand yeah. the delicacies around it and the, yeah. the need yeah. to, to keep yeah. things confidential. Yeah, yeah. and it's fine. hard juggling that those funders as well at the moment, isn't it? Because people are a bit unsure about this kind of work. Um and obviously, you know, Sarah Briggs said, you know, um, that they are may are independent, so they can explore these things with with the confidence. And I think there's been a bit of uneasiness about where some of those other funders stand. So, uh, yeah, it's it's tricky, very tricky. But um, I think you know, trying to explore it in 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 the best way that we can in at the moment, I think, is the best that we can do. Okay. Thank you. Brilliant. But, I mean, people thinking. are still doing decolonisation, right. so, you know. Yeah, yes. I think it's what a 21st century museum should be doing. But yes, it's, it's just a slowly turning tide. You can't change people's perceptions overnight. But yeah. um, so we also recognise that too. But you thank to, you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, you have to take people along on the journey. You'll never get people really there do. by railroading them. Yeah. yeah, otherwise they become very resistant. But um, absolutely. no, that's absolutely brilliant. I will leave you to it. And thank you so All much. All right. Thanks, Sarah. All right. Take care. All right. Bye. Bye bye. Sorry about the visuals. <laughs> that's OK, Dominic. You've got um, Sarah's email in the chat there. Did you pick that up? No, yeah, I'll send you an email, Sarah. Lovely, that's Lovely. great. Thank you. And sorry I was late, I just couldn't get in. I was hovering around outside. Don't, don't, don't worry, don't worry. You've got Sarah's email now, so you know well, you can yeah. ask her all the questions. Hopefully she won't mind. Okay, thank you. <laughs> all right, take care. Bye. Bye-bye. Thanks, Sarah. I just, just before you go, I just want to make yeah. sure that I have my questions got answered in case they come up at a later date from anybody. Mm -hmm. So if you were to go through that like expression of interest phase yeah. and you weren't selected, yeah. what would that mean? You know, would it be okay to sort of regroup and then come back like in the spring or would that be sort of? Not, no. So you no. have to, you okay. can't reapply. Um, occasionally we'll reinvite people to, to, to reapply. So actually the Butterflies Through Time Project is a really unusual one because they were shortlisted um, and there wasn't enough money in the pot that round, but the, okay. the, foundation loved it so much they wanted us to bring it straight forward to the next round so it's a very rare thing but it does happen and in butterflies through time it worked out really well for them um but no essentially it generally speaking if you're not shortlisted you can reapply to the fund but you do need to have a different focus so it could be the same collection that you're working on but with just a different focus or it could be um, that you want to work with the same audience group, but you rethink your collections focus. So you can, and do you, you can, get that kind of feedback from yourself? Yeah, I always That's give feedback. Yeah, I okay. always give feedback. Yeah. Okay. Um, how many grants do you sort of, on average, then fund? You know, in a round. So it, it's about seven. Is about an average that we've just funded. Um, and so yeah, so we say between 14 and 20 per year um it does depend you know how, we have a set pot of yeah. money for each, each each round basically so if um 
if if we have every project applies applies for fifty thousand pounds instead of ninety thousand pounds, we're going to be able to fund a lot more. But we always fund based on the merit of the project and try and they yeah. try and fund as many as they possibly can out of each. So project. on the rare occasion, if there's nothing wrong with the project, but it's just about you know the total amount of money you've got, you may yeah. like the, roll that project over, but it's obviously yeah happen yeah very often. It's Thank always you. some really tough decisions because the fund's always oversubscribed. So um, really, and we had such a high quality of applications, the, the last round especially, I think because we encourage those conversations. So if it's not right for the fund, you probably won't apply because I probably will have told you, you know, that it's okay. just not. So okay. um, it does mean that all of the shortlisted projects are completely and utterly fundable, but they're not, they're not all going to get funded. So we tend to fund about half of the shortlisted projects. So the discussions that, that they have with you pre-expression of interest are absolutely key. They are they are very important. It's we'll still yeah. consider your expression of interest if you haven't spoken to me. And yeah. that does happen sometimes due to time constrictions, but I would always encourage it because if you're on the wrong lines, I don't want to waste anybody's time in applying for funds. I know time's so precious yeah. in museums. Okay. So there's no limit to the amount of 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 one to one time you give an organization leading up to that EOI or is it or is that just it yeah, it does depend on the demand. So I tend to say about 15 minute conversation is usually enough. Um and sometimes with with applications they might have more than one conversation with me, depending if they've spoken to me a long time previously. They might want to catch up with me nearer the time. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, you asked, answered the backfilling question I had. Um, I was just wondering about evaluation, what your expectations were around evaluation. And I mean, mm -hmm. I presume that that's part of the application process anyway. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then what happens like after that? Do you, do, what does the organization do at the end of their funded period? Do they have to sort of submit an evaluation yeah. report? And then is there subsequent ones of those like later on or is it just that one at the end of the project it's just generally so we we ask for a report at the end of each year so if it's a two-year project what well, you would submit two reports to us one at the end of year one and one at the very end of the project um i i i sometimes have mid-project conversations with people so i will visit some projects and talk to them about what's going on halfway through the project as well and i'm here to support projects all the way through so if people are just not sure about something i'm here for them to contact um, but yeah, it's, the, it's an end of project report. It's not too onerous, actually. It's about eight pages long. Um, we, we expect some project planning documents to be submitted before we would give out the fund anyway, and that will include some robust plans for how the project's going to be evaluated. So, you know, we do make sure that that, that that's being considered. Um, and then we'll look at the end of the project about, we'll, we'll get people to form those three outcomes that I talked about in my presentation. And then at the end of the project, it's about showing how far they've achieved those outcomes. Okay, so the project planning docs come after essentially you've been awarded. Yeah, we get you yes, to do okay. a logic modeling work, and for, or you get you have to com complete a work plan for the second stage application. We ask the question, "What would you do?" and we would expect yeah. a work plan from that. Um, and then, yeah, then once if you're awarded fund funding, you finalise your budget, you complete a logic model and work plan, and um, you get three outcomes to us, and then that will then trigger the payment. Okay. And in terms of, I'm presuming that, um, say, um, you know, Sarah looked at her project and she said, oh, this is a multi-phased project here that we've got mm -hmm. here. Is that, do, me, do you ever fund projects in that way or do you very much like want something of a completely different topic or completely different audience, like you say, or would you, would you look at something and go, okay, well, this is sort of like a phase one that does X these outcomes uh -huh. and that we might you know that maybe then Sarah might want to come back you know two years later and say okay now mm -hmm. we, we need to move this on now still broadly dealing with the same yeah. sort of things but might be doing like a different yeah. project work or whatever so so with our um uh, on our new models applications the ones where you need to reach that certain level of the power to the people framework before you can apply um, we are very open to people trialling those for a couple of years and then potentially reapplying for longer term funding. So before the pandemic hit, we wanted to, we were, we were planning on providing grants of up to five years. Um, and then that was what we were going to do in 2020. And then the pandemic hit and everything went up in the air and it just didn't feel appropriate to offer the funding that we were going to do, which was so tied into strategic goals and aims because so many museums are going to have to change those now. So 
um, we're, we're offering these new models as two years, but saying that then you can apply, you can apply again to extend those in the future. Mm. So yeah, for the new models, yes, you can, that's fine. Mm. 